We have around 140 customers using our platform to open up their API, control to a certain extent who is using their API and how those people are using their API, and eventually monetize the way their API is being used. And the topic of my presentation is going to be about API business models. So obviously, there is no way to be exhaustive and extremely precise about all the business model options and possibilities, but we'll try to cover uh, at least the most significant one and try to class classify them uh, in, in, uh, in meaningful categories. So we all, we've all heard about the rise of the APIs, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. We know about the billionaire club, Twitter, Google, Amazon, Salesforce, Bing. I mean, they're the ones that we hear every day in the press. Uh, to be honest, I'm a bit like Kin. I'm tired of hearing and talk about those APIs. And I think there is many more cases, many more interesting cases of APIs that we could talk about. And hopefully this is uh, happening. What is interesting is the rise in numbers of APIs. So Programmable Web has recently listed 8,000 APIs uh, listed on their public listing. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, uh, at Freescale, we estimate there's probably five to 10 times more APIs out there that are not listed on programmable web. They're private, they're semi-private, they're truly private, whatever. They're connectors to some companies' infrastructure data or content that are not made available publicly. And they will soon be, and I'll explain you why. The interesting thing also is that given the growth rate of those APIs, we estimate that by 2017, there will probably at least one million APIs available out there for people to use, play, and consume, and integrate within their businesses, their applications, or their services. So that's massive, and that's definitely disrupting the way the web uh, is evolving. So as I was mentioning, they're everywhere, okay? Media, infrastructure, business services, SaaS integration purposes, whatever. And they're disrupting many different industries. Telecom being probably one of the main ones being disrupted. Banking also, with examples like Stripe. So it's really changing the way the, the, way, the, the, way the web uh, is, is, uh, is moving forward. API 101, we've, I'm not going to bother you with the Wikipedia uh, definition, which is uh, quite arid. Uh, basically, it's a software to software uh, communication channel. For business people who are not very familiar uh, with APIs uh, or don't want to bother with uh, technology, basically, as Adam Devender from Programmable Web summarized a few months ago, it means apps, partners, and eventually incomes. Okay? What I believe even more interesting is this uh, quote from Diane Inchcliffe, which is actually from 2008. Okay? So four years ago. And he said, we're nearing the time when opening our supply chains across the web is just, is, isn't just a good idea. It will be essential for competitive survival. And this is exactly, I think, where we're at or what, where we're going right now as of today. For, again, business people, uh, Katarina Flake, Fake from Flickr says it's bizdev 2.0. Uh, and I truly believe in that for many reasons. And again, we'll cover that in the presentation. So why is it important to have an API? Well, everybody has a website. You reach a lot of people with your data, with your content, with your technology, but that's a very limited reach, okay? And it's very non-efficient from a cost and a time and a resource point of view because you have to spend a lot of energy and time and money to make sure that you reach a significant pool of people to make money out of it or to generate business for your company. The interest of APIs is that you can tap into third parties, developers, other infrastructures, other networks to expand your business, to innovate, to create new things that will be attractive for new customers that you have never spoken or that you never know, that you had never known about before. And this is the purpose of your API. This is to make your, your business more ubiquitous and really useful to many more people as you were uh, making it available before. 
some data that we've done from uh, that we that we've got from uh, from an analysis of the we uh, programmable web uh, listing is that usually 50 percent, around 50 percent of the companies that open an API is it for multi-channel purposes. Obviously, the mobile one uh, represents a big chunk, but still, when you look at this diagram, it's only 11 percent, okay, of the uses of the API. The multi-channel strategy is definitely prominent in the use and consumption of APIs. From a business point of view, there are tons of reasons why you could justify an API within your business. Okay, uh, We have 12 here. As we've already mentioned, create new business channels, partner up with some other companies, and facilitate ease those integrations and those partnerings. Build an ecosystem, power mobile apps, serve any type of device software anywhere, protect IPR to a certain extent. That's the more capitalistic, probably, way <laughs> of seeing an API. Uh, rationals, rationalize and control access to your resources, reach more customers, etc. I'm not going to bother you with the whole list, but there are tons of applications. I mean, if you were to use, to have an API for only one purpose, I think it's been mentioned a lot throughout all the presentations, it's at least to make your own company more agile and make sure that all your employees, all your departments, all your divisions can access your assets in a very agile, easy way so that your company can evolve faster, better, and innovate more and more. So an API brings strategic advantages, business advantages, new revenue streams, at least from a business point of view. So what now? An API is important. We, I think we can agree about that, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. But what do we take, what do we do from here? So a few, a few takeaways, are probably known by, by some of you. First, don't put lipstick on a pig, it would still be a pig. And what does that mean? It means that if you don't have something interesting to offer that nobody cares about, don't create an API. It's not worth it. From a business point of view, don't just build an API and think that it will come. I mean, you might be waiting very long. An API is not just a magnet that attracts anybody and everybody. And all of a sudden, you're going to have thousands of people creating new services and applications on top of your API, especially if you're not a Twitter or Facebook or a Google, you're not famous, you're not known, you'll definitely have to do some promotion of your API, convince people that they have an interest in using your API. As Kim was mentioning earlier today, you have to tell a story and you have to tell a nice story and explain to those people why they should be using your API. At the end of the day, an API, let's forget about the technical definition. What is it? It's a channel into your core business assets or your core business value, okay? Let's forget about the acronym. Let's forget about the technology behind it from a business point of view. It's a way to distribute your content, your data, your technology, your services. So instead of asking what business model for my API? You should probably ask yourself, what API for my business model? What API is going to serve my business model? What API is going to serve my company? And is going to be useful to third parties, to developers, to people? So from that statement, from that starting point, let's see a few basics when you talk about API. Who's familiar with the MVC framework? Okay, some of you. MVC framework is a way to do programming, to structure the way you develop a new software and new application, okay? So you have three elements, presentations, logic, and data, and you decouple them so that you make your whole new software more agile and more evolvable. And as API enable cloud scale MVC, they allow you to, to focus on your core assets. Okay, MVC connects components, APIs connect businesses. When you have a core asset, whether data, so in M in France, or whatever uh, the statistical institute you have here, or uh, federal uh, government in, in USA, uh, whatever, their core asset is data. Some other companies have logic. Some other companies have a presentation software, a presentation tool or solution. 
you need to be able to identify what is your core asset, what is the most valuable one, and from that point of view, try to imagine and foresee what are going to be the added value or the interest of people for people to use these core assets through an API. Okay, so three key elements when you define your API business strategy. Identify your core asset, choose a complementary asset that will be will deliver most value and will be more valuable to the people using your API. And the third one is define a strategy to capture the value, okay, which is correlated to just don't build it and think they will come. Some examples of API, API business strategy, Netflix, uh, they're focusing on the presentation. Twilio is the logic, the technology, whereas InfoChimps uh, is uh, focusing on the data uh, element or components of the MVC model. Some API typologies to consider when you want to create one or open it up to third parties. Uh, there is a typical three categories, private, partners, public. You don't necessarily have to go that way. It could be public first and private at the end. Doesn't really make sense. Or it could be the three altogether. But definitely it ha doesn't have to be a private one to start with. We have many customers that have basically their API as their product, as their core technology, and their API is what they sell. Okay, And they've started with a public API right away. You have different rationals to choose one element or the other, or one over the other. Uh, again, this depends on how capable you will be at convincing, evangelizing your own company, your own team to implement an API, and which arguments you think will Will, will, will ring bell, more bells with them and convince them to go with an API. In general, the API openness cycle could be looked like, look like that. Uh, so the first one is raw services, okay? You offer your very core, basic, non-shaped, non-fine-grain, non-fine-tuned data or technology through an API for internal use. Okay, that's a raw service. Then you have that for internal reuse. So you're going to spread the API to other departments, to other uh, divisions of your company that will see an interest in accessing those raw assets, those raw data, those raw technology through an API to develop faster, better applications and services. Then there is a customer reuse. I'm going to develop a mobile application that is going to be built on top of my API then the partner and distribution, and then open to anybody, the 1,000 flowers, which at the end of the day turned out that Netflix, 90% uh, of Netflix API traffic is internal, but that's another story that uh, Kin already, already told. So definitely some principles, some, some, some not rules, I don't like to call them rules, but ideas to have in mind when it comes to open up an, a an API and, and make the, pr the project grow over time and evolve over time. We've been, the, t the, the purpose of the talk is API business models. Uh, this is one way to represent those API business models. Uh, this is John Messer from Programmable Web who drew that map. Uh, free, developer pays, developer gets paid, indirect, and all the children of those different models. I think actually this is more about monetization model rather than business model in the broad sense of a business. And I'm going to explain you why. But it's definitely valuable and definitely useful if you think in making money out of your API, leveraging this, this, uh, the, those, uh, those options. The other thing to take into consideration is how you're going to deliver your API. You've convinced your people to have an API. You know that you have core assets that are valuable to deliver through an API. You've decided to make it public, private, only available to partners, all, that, all of that at one time. You've identified some opportunities to generate business value, money out of it. The final step probably is think about delivery, okay? You want to make your API available to developers, customers, partners internally, but there's tons of questions popping up. And whether we like them or not, the human being has some uh, history, some, 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 some habits of 
accessing con access control, security, monetization, mon monitoring, how am I going to know who's going to do what and when, and how can I identify them, and how can I control them, and is it going to be scalable? You have all those questions that are going to appear, and you're going to have to answer them, yes or yes. Opening up an API is, is not a side project by far. So you'll probably want an API management solution for that purpose. Disclaimer, I work for Thrayscale. As I said at the beginning, it's an API management solution provider. But to cover those questions, okay, whether it's Mesh React, PG Layer 7, SOA software, Thrayscale, you're going to have to do something, or eventually in-house. But honestly, that would be reinventing the wheel. So to summarize API business strategy 101, I think that uh, for the ones who, who are more coming from the business side, there are some three key questions that you have to ask yourself and your company when you, when you launch a new product is, what is going to be my product? What is, I what is, what is that I'm going to sell? Who will be using it? And how am I going to sell it? Okay, and so there are different business cases. Uh, sorry about the font misplacing. All those questions have to be answered. And right now what we're going to cover is what is your API? Is it the product? Does it promote the product? Does it project the product? Does it powers and feed the product? Which are the business model categorization that we see at Thrayscale. Some recommendations before you, you, you jump into an API project. So the first one is we believe API first, mobile second, web third. Uh, it's a like, transformed quote from a famous VC Fred Wilson, who once wrote a blog post saying, <laughs> mobile first, API second, web third. I th don't agree with him. I think your API should be first because your API is the fundamental for anything you're going to build, whether it's a mobile or a web application. The second is do your homework. It's not a side project. Again, I insist. You need to know what you're going to provide for an API. It's a channel into your core business, into your valuable assets. So, what am I going to provide for an API? To who? How? Start small. This is something that has been said quite a lot of time today. Kin mentioned a few stories about it. You've got to start small. If you start opening up everything from the beginning, you're going to end up with, I don't remember what Mike's uh, description of this uh, prehistoric dinosaur was, but you're going to end up with a monster, tentaculous monster that you're never going to be able to control. Okay, so you've got to start small, small experiment with a few elements of your core valuable asset, open them, open them little by little and see how it goes and evolve. Evolve is definitely a key word here. Evolve your API strategy, evolve your API business, evolve the assets that you're going to offer through your API. Provide a compelling value proposition comes back to don't put lipstick on a pig, it will still look like a pig. Quite obvious, but sometimes people tend to forget it. And remain flexible, uh, which is probably Twitter, the uh, antithesis of this, of, this, uh, of this corollary. Don't, I've said it, it, don't consider API as a site project. It will fail. Don't even start it if it's a site project or if your company thinks it's a site project. Second, don't neglect developers. Even if your primary idea is to make your relationship with your partners more agile, better, more efficient, and get money out of it, developers are, at the end of the day, the ones who are going to be using your API, are going to be the ones who are going to develop applications, mobile, web, whatever, on top of your API. And you need to take good care of those guys. Otherwise, they'll run away. And that goes through good documentation, that goes through good sample code, and that goes through very good and clear terms and conditions. Obviously, you can change them over time, but be careful about it, and be careful how you do that. So, API typologies. At Threescale, we think that there are four types of APIs. There are APIs that are the product. So, a typical example is Twilio. Everybody knows Twilio, I guess. Twilio started by opening up an API for voice communication and SMS. Their API is their core product. And from that, they've been evolving into developing new widgets, apps, etc. Then you have a second type of API, which is the API projects of products. 
The example is Salesforce. You have Salesforce API that projects the Salesforce core CRM platform. And through the Salesforce API and the force.com marketplace, you have access to, ton of, to tons of applications that are built on top or leveraging the Salesforce API. And so that projects the Salesforce product and push people to eventually use more of the product and therefore spend more money on salesforce.com. The third one is the API promotes the product, Amazon. Even though it has been evolving over time and you can do transactions through the API, originally in the first versions of the Amazon API were just projecting the listings of products that you could purchase on Amazon.com. Okay? And the, the fourth one is powers and feed the product, Twitter. The Twitter API is not only powerful in the sense of it enables the creation of new, or it used to enable the creation of new products and interesting products. It was also feeding the Twitter platform. This is how Twitter became so powerful as of today, is because they've got all those data, all those users, all those analytics that it can generate out of their databases, and their API was feeding this database. So that's the fourth type of category we were seeing. Digging a little bit deeper, when you consider the API or your API is your product, it will definitely, if you're a company that wants to make money, it's definitely going to be important for you to generate direct revenue. And the API being the product is going to be the way to monetize, to generate revenues. Okay? Making pay people to use your API to consume it, whether it's on a per transaction basis, whether it's a monthly fee, whatever the pricing model you're going to set up, it's going to be a direct revenue source. Tier pricing bands is, a, is another option. Project the product, reach more places, provides more utility, enable mobile eventually, and allows deeper integration. We're going to give a deeper look at salesforce.com and how they do that, but that's, I think, a very good example of this uh, projection, product projection. The third one is promotes the product, business development, lead generation. User acquisition, advertising, brand promotion, affiliate programs. And the fourth one powers and feeds the product, which is content acquisition. Tie in your partners, even though it might sound bad in some cases, or for some people it's probably a, an interesting way, at least not necessarily good, but interesting way to make business, and especially internal innovation. The ones from which you'll be able to generate direct revenues, definitely when your API is a product and eventually when the API projects a product. Basically, what does that mean? It means that the customer will be able to experience or to, to experience your services, your data, your technology only through the API. Okay? Sales through channel, Skype is, is, is working like that. White label channel, you have, you have keycaps, which is another example. And indirect revenues, the two other options I was mentioning. Promote the products, feed the product. The API is a supporting element to your business. This is going something that's going to bring additional customers, additional content, additional data that you're going to be able to monetize through another channel. Twitter, frame modality was used to be one of those. Oodle affiliate model is one of those two. So digging a little bit deeper, the API is a product. API is core value to the company. So I mentioned Twilio, Music Match. I don't know if you, if you know this company. Music Match is basically one of the leading providers of lyrics, legal lyrics. They have a database of more than 5 million lyrics, I think, as far as I remember. And it's provided through an API. Obviously, they've developed some applications, mobile apps, iPhone, iPad, Spotify, whatever, to extend their reach and, and make it easier to consume their API and, and generate brand awareness. But their core product is an API. Twilio is the same. Bringing easy access to complex telecom technology through an easy API to use. They're making money when the core services usage grows. It's a direct revenue model. There is an ecosystem strategy associated to it, which is obviously direct customer usage, but encouraging reselling also. So partnership, people reselling your product, 
you can build a new technology knowledge. You can build a new ecosystem of people that will learn your technology and will be more eager every day to build new services, new apps. <coughs> Enabling new services that might disrupt an entire industry or pieces of an industry and encourage third party tools. Some other APIs that fall into that category is Amazon Web Services. You all know about it. Stripe, I'm pretty sure you all know about it. Everybody knows about Stripe, yeah? Skype and Music Match. The API project's a product. So basically, through the API, your product is being incorporated, integrated within somebody's product into somebody else's user experience that is being delivered through his product. Salesforce.com is a typical example. They have 1,700 apps built on top of their API. They have 50,000 plus developers using their API and developing new things. And basically, all those apps enable the integration of Salesforce into a third party product. What does that mean? That means that Salesforce is making money when there is an increasing customer spend. And there is an increasing customer, sp customer spend and when there is a number of customer increasing also. So there are two parameters. First, more money spent and more customers. Because if you have more, more customers paying your, your Salesforce, uh, whatever, the, the, the monthly fee to, to use it, it's going to be better. For core product, ecosystem strategy, you have to cultivate your partnership to make sure that you convince third parties to embed your technology, your services within their own platform, within their own services. And by providing them a good API to use and to leverage. New services, third party tools, a bit, some elements are, are, are um, overlapping with the, with the first uh, category, API is a product, but definitely the partnership uh, ecosystem or the affiliate ecosystem is, is, a, is an important one. Some examples of APIs uh, that are projecting the products, uh, Yellow Pages in Canada, eBay, Hoover's, Spotify, FedEx. They all extend their product reach by embedding it into third parties application or services via the API. The API promotes the product. So I was mentioning Amazon.com. We're almost done. <laughs> Amazon.com uh, basically promoted its product, its platform, through creating widgets that you could embed anywhere, and those widgets are obviously calling their API. Okay, so it's the more the more you see Amazon.com all over the place, the more you see the AP, the Pajon or Yellow Pages uh, uh, widgets all over the place, the more inclined you'll be to use those services. Okay, so it's promoting your business, your services. And that's the opposite from the previous example. You'll make more money when the number of customers grow primarily and then when they will spend money on it. But here, the critical KPI is definitely number of users. Ecosystem strategy, there are different uh, elements. Probably the, 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 two, uh, the two ones that I would uh, highlight are uh, promote to niches and distribute teaser information. Brand diffusion, obviously, I mean, since you're promoting your service, that's uh, the main purpose, uh, but that comes with, with some, some uh, extra costs that not everybody is willing to pay. Some examples of APIs falling into this category, as per our beliefs, are Expedia, Dig, Vimeo, and Netflix. And finally, APIs powers and feeds the product. So, content, uh, user content generated, uh, reviews, ratings, comments, all those elements that, will be, that you will be gathering through your API. Twitter is a good example. Um, they have been gathering all those trends, all those uh, data about how people feel, like, don't like, disagree, and therefore build forecast on some elements, for examples. The key driving factor for this business model is user-generated content. You need to make sure that by having your API used by as many products and services, you'll get as many content 
populated into your database, into your system, so that you can offer an interesting, valuable service to third party from your either web apps, mobile apps, whatever. Typically, the ecosystem strategy in that case, and probably the, 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 the one I will strike out, is the leverage, uh, leverage of social, social networks, which is probably the most critical strategy or elements of strategy to have when you have an API that is going to power and feed uh, your product. Some examples of API that fall into that category, Foursquare, Discuss, uh, YouTube, and obviously Facebook. So a few uh, conclusions. Uh, there is no one prominent uh, model. Uh, there is not one model that supersedes all the ones that I've been mentioning. It's actually weird, well, weird, interesting and, 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 and fun to see that there is a rather good proportion of APIs in each, uh, in each model. The, the distribution is pretty even between API is a product, API pro, uh, project is a product, or is a product addition, okay? There are some others which are totally, uh, or at least weren't described there, which are government and non-for-profit. It's something that is also growing quite fast right now. Uh, but, I mean, their main purpose is definitely not to make money. And scientific also. Uh, there's a, a few famous uh, scientific APIs. Uh, one that comes uh, to my mind right now is the Mandalay API, for example. So a lot of, lot of resources, scientific resources that you can get for free or not through an API. As I was mentioning, uh, I think the most important question when you start an API project is not what is my business model for my API. It's what is going to be my API or what API for my business model. That's, I think, and I believe, very important to turn this, the, the question that way and not the way around. And the corollary questions to that one are, what are my core assets? Probably everybody knows that when you work at a company, but sometimes it might be forgotten on the way to uh, developing such a project. Who will use my API and for what purpose? Or at least, how do I want to promote that, uh, that, uh, that API and make sure that I create a valuable ecosystem around it, and how will I make my API available? And the three elements that I was mentioning earlier, again, don't put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. Don't think that because you've, gonna, you've got an API, all of a sudden you're going to be the king of the world. And third, don't forget your core valuable assets within your company. An API is just a channel into them. Any questions? Kind of. I don't see Expedia as a product. Well, Ex Expedia is a service, more, pro more than a product, I agree. So it's, they're, they're offering a tool for you to find the cheapest flight, train ticket, whatever. Uh, but in that sense, it promotes, and you're totally right, the, their API promotes their product, but how, do, how does the promotion? Basically, you embed the Expedia information, and you get rerouted to the Expedia website, where you're going to do the transaction and purchase the ticket. So Expedia makes $2 billion a year through their API because they have tons of affiliates websites and people that have embedded their content, which is hotel information, rooms availability, prices, flight tickets, etc., into third parties' website and reroute to Expedia when you, when you click, I want this hotel. It's, yeah, I, I, should, I probably should have said product slash service slash product is, is, is what you're selling, basically. Okay. So whether it's a technology, data, services, that's what I mean by the product, but wouldn't have fit on the slide.